Before we go on to uh, chapter two, I want to go over some of the notes that Mendy and Sophie have collected from your notes, your weekly class notes, pronunciation journals, etc. <clears throat> there are a number of um, misunderstandings out there among some of you, and so I'm going to take this time to try to clear some of them up, because some of them seem to be turning up over and over again, so they're worth discussing. All right, just sheet by sheet here. I've got several sets of notes here. First of all, everybody please pay attention. Please pay attention. What is this? All right, it's a glottal stop. And how do we make a glottal stop? Everybody make a glottal stop. Okay, it sounds like the whole class is burping. Yes, burping is da ge. Although da ge is not exactly the same. That's a glottal stop. It's a question mark without a, without a dot at the bottom, okay? I want you to look at this symbol. If you can't see it clearly, either come up close to the front or look it up in your textbook or look it up online. Is this? A backwards version of this? No. Many of you have the mistaken impression that this symbol, which is a, a tap, is a backwards glottal stop symbol. So those of you who had that impression, please correct it now because the TAs are complaining. <laughs> because it seems to be turning up over and over and over again. So some of you definitely have this misunderstanding. This looks just like a cane. And when it's printed very often, you won't see the line at the bottom. If it is a sans font, it won't have a line. If it is a Times New Roman type font, it will have a line. In writing, I put it in, in handwriting, because it may look like an R without it. This line at the bottom makes it clear, and I see in phonetic transcriptions, that's how it's usually written. So, it looks like a cane, 一个拐杖,下面是一行,所插在土里的一个拐杖. So, All right? Glottal stop tap, please clarify those in your mind. And this symbol, 严格来说,is a trill. In Spanish, we have both these sounds. For example, the word for but is pero, pero, deisha, pero, and we use the symbol. For the word dog, this is a double R, and that's trilled. Remember the definition of a trill is the tongue tip has to make contact with the alveolar ridge at least how many times? Three times. This is perro. Perro. Perro means 可是. Perro means go. Okay? That's a trill. So please make these sounds really clear in your head. There's another one that's created a lot of confusion, and part of it is because I didn't explain it all clearly at the beginning. I gave you this symbol when we were talking about, about um, hua yin, about glides in Chinese. This symbol, a great big circle with a line through it. This is a mathematical symbol for a null set. And we call it a zero initial in English. And ling sheng mu in Chinese. Gui ling de ling, sheng yin de sheng, mu qin de mu, gui ling sheng mu. And that is when we don't have a glottal stop and we don't have a glide in front of a vowel. And the two vowels we're talking about are u and e. So if we just say wu lai, wu lai with no wu and no u, then we have a zero initial and we don't normally mark it. The reason I introduced the symbol is because we needed a contrast with, in the case of wu lai, for example, we needed a contrast with wu as in wu lai, 
Some people in some situations say ulai with a glottal stop. But some people, I don't want to put these brackets around here to confuse you. Some people just have ulai, we call that ling sheng mu. Now, then Stanley started doing some deeper research. He said, ah, but this vowel occurs in languages like Norwegian, ö, and it's the o umlaut. In German, in spelling, we write it with an o with the two dots over it. Ö, ö, like hö is high. Um, these, are, these are very different things. This is not a 正统的 IPA symbol. It's used only in 汉语语言学。汉语的那个声韵学里面会用到这个东西. Just because we need a contrast between these two. We can't tell. We've got three possibilities, so we need a symbol for the third one. Just writing a vowel doesn't really call our attention to the problem. So this is not an IPA symbol. This is used in exclusively, as far as I know, in Chinese linguistics. It may be used elsewhere, and I don't know about it, but I know that it's not in the IPA. It's a large zero. It's a mathematical symbol. The smaller circle with a line is e, and that is a mid-high front rounded vowel. Let's find it in the table so that we know what we're talking about, OK? The vowels are on the inside back cover of your book. Can you find ö uh there? Here is our vowel space on the bottom part of the inside cover. And you can see that it is a mid-high front rounded vowel. And that's usually written like this in German, ö. Uh. OK? So two very, very different things. There's even a third symbol that got confused into this question. While you're still on that page, on the inside cover, look under, in the consonants, look under bilabial fricative on the voiceless side on the left. Do you see something else that looks sort of similar again? All right, so this has got a big circle, not an IPA symbol. This is a smaller symbol. It is an IPA symbol for a vowel. Here we have a third symbol, a circle with a line straight through the middle, up and down, straight vertical line. This is a consonant. It's a, bi, a voiceless bilabial fricative. And we're going to learn about it second semester. I don't think we'll get to it this semester. But just so you know what it is, everybody look and listen. It's, it's just like spreading your lips and blowing out air. And I'll put the vowel e after it. So listen, fi, fi. If it were f, it would be fi, fi. I'll use the microphone to make it clearer. F with an E sound is fi, fi. But this is a voiceless bilabial fricative, fi, fi. Just xiao yi xiao, a little bit. And then blow air out. OK? And then if you put a vowel after it, fi, fa, fe, fo. I smell the blood of an Englishman, OK? Um, so those are three different symbols. Is that clear now? Don't mix them up. Whenever you're not clear, first of all, check yourself. And if you can't resolve it, please ask. And make sure that you check in often to NTU Phonetics on Facebook. Now, what better excuse could you have for going and checking into Facebook, right? Do we need an excuse? No, but here is one anyway. Going to Facebook means that you're goofing off and not doing your work. But in this case, you're keeping up with phonetics class. So you can tell your mother, I'm doing my phonetics work. <laughs> okay? It's not just fooling around on Facebook, chatting with my friends. But you have friends in the phonetics group as well. So anyway, um, that's clear. We have a number of other questions. I'm just going to pick out some of them, because otherwise it's going to take forever, because there are quite a few things. One of them is palato. Yihung alveolar. That's what we learned in the text, right? Palato. The first part is an adjective. The second part is also an adjective. Well, you can call it an adverb in that case. If palatal is an adjective, then, uh, uh, sorry, if alveolar is an adjective, then palato is an adverb. 
uh, modifying the adjective. Because the palato alveolar, you can down means in that case, palato is the adjective, alveolar is the noun. So it's palato, P A L A T O, Yi Hung, alveolar. If it's the one that's reversed for Qi Qi Xi in Chinese on the Polish sounds, then it is alveolo, al, it's just A L V E O L O, Yi Hung, palato. 所以名词我们就把它当名词，名词的部分有 alveolar, alveolo, palatal for GTC. For adding an S to words, it could be a noun, it could be a verb, it could be all kinds of things, it could be either a plural form, it could be third person singular of a verb, or it could be the possessive. Some of you may need to review that, those rules because you're still having trouble with them, some of you. I'm writing an article on that right now for Shi De. That's going to be number eight. You've already read up to number seven, which is Stop at Stops. Number eight will be about S and Z. So that's still being written. Um, the symbol A. We have two different ways of writing A. We have this one and we have this one. Please make sure that you distinguish one, them. Uh, this one is used for what kind of vowel? Monophthongs. And remember, this has got a weird spelling. Monoph, P-H-T-H. P-H-T-H-O-N-G. Monophthongs of damuin. This one is used for diphthongs. This one doesn't look as quadzong because it's not quite so long. And I'm more used to it. So diphthong, we use this one for diphthongs. This is for monophthong. So I and ao will use this A. Everyone clear on that? Watch out when you're typing. And when you're inputting IPA symbols, we have a very handy tool called iSpeak. If you missed that post on Facebook, go back and look at it. I'll try to put the link on our syllabus page as well. iSpeak, shuru IPA hanfang bian. Then there's another one when you're doing romanization. There's a pinyin tone tool. So you don't have to use numbers. You just input the numbers. It will change it over to the correct tone mark on the correct vowel. Okay? But you can get lazy that way. So if you don't know where those two tools are, look on Facebook or I'll put the links up as soon as possible. As for sib sibilant, some of you has, have asked about this. This, is, this doesn't have an extremely stable tr uh, translation in Chinese. But what I have seen for in Taiwan writing, for Taiwan is more common. For mainland China, Siyin is more common. Not more common, that's just what they use. Okay? Taiwan, Dalu. But you may see this in Taiwan as well. There's a lot of mutual influence now, as you know. So don't be surprised if you see one or the other. It's not a big deal to me, as long as you know what you're talking about. And sibilant in English. How many sib sibilants are there in English? Six, right. And two of them are affricates. So they're actually kind of compound sounds. Mm. See what else we have here. Do some of you still have problems with j and j? Because I get asked this question over and over and over again every year. Remember that j is what kind of a sound? The manner of articulation is what? What kind of sound is it? What's its manner of articulation? It's a fricative, that's right. Voiced or voiceless? This one happens to be voiced, and don't say voiced, it's voiced. voiced. Not so much bo. Boy, 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 nigga, ah, hen duan, hen duan, hen kuai jiu dai guo qiu. Actually, I've heard native speakers say voice as well, but I don't, so learn my way. I think it's more common. So, voiced. voiced. That's better. Make that all really short. Voiced. voiced. That's much better. Okay, my ears like that. This one is voiced, and we pronounce it how? Je. Some of you will mistakenly say je 
It's easy to fix. All you do is take the voiceless counterpart of this sound, which is shh, and add voicing. It's very easy. So, shh. Right. The one you mix it up with is this sound. What kind of a sound is this? What's its manner of articulation? It's an affricate, which is composed of a stop, not stop, please, in my dialect. Stop. stop. Thank you. Stop plus a fricative together. And you have it in Chinese, like that is also an affricate, and it's very similar to this one, especially the way it's pronounced in Taiwan. It doesn't sound like English, but in, in Taiwan, sounds very similar. So this one has a stop at the beginning. It's so fast. If you just use theory to explain it, you may not get it, but you've got that D there. J and J. So make sure that you distinguish those clearly. And all right, we've got this issue about how to write the. We're okay with schwa, I think. Schwa is not a phoneme, really. You can call it one, but you can argue both ways. But basically, a schwa is a reduced vowel. Going back in history, the vowel was a full vowel, as far as we know. And you can tell from the spelling what it probably was. But many unstressed syllables now have a schwa instead of a full vowel. So that's a schwa. Now, KK, when he designed his system, he also decided to make a distinction between a roticized vowel. We haven't learned this term. Some people say rhotic, some people say rhotic. I think I say rhotic, but it sounds funny when you say erotic. Don't think it's anything, anything improper. So erotic, erotic. I'll probably say rhotic just to avoid the silly puns. All right, so I haven't heard dis ag agreement on this. I've heard different pronunciations. Rhotic just means erhua. In Chinese, it's erhua yun. Erhua yun. So if we make this a rhotic sound or rhotic sound, after, say after a, a schwa, it becomes er, uh, becomes er. And KK decided, Kenina not decided, that schwas are not to be used in stressed syllables. So we have a separate symbol for the rhoticized uh when it's not stressed. If we have a rhoticized vowel, with the uh sound, like in bird. They decided to use a different symbol, and it looks like the number three. So this is uh, we don't have this sound in American English at all. It's used in British. So in British, we would write bud with this vowel, bud. No R after the vowel. After the vowel, we can also call post-vocalic. No post-vocalic R. So, Kenyon and Nat sort of kept the same system, but he added a hook on it to show that it's rhoticized. Okay, I just put a little mark like this. In American, because this is a single syllable and it's a content word, we stress it, so we write bird like this. Now we could write it like this if we made a different decision, but Kenyon and Nat made a rule that schwa is never used in a stressed syllable. Now you can argue for or against this. It doesn't really matter, but I think you just pick a system and you use it. And I decided to stay with the KK system on this point. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I would just like people to be consistent and you're used to this. So for teacher, teacher, we'll use this one. If it's stressed, we'll use this one. Without the hook, we don't have that symbol in American. It's used in standard British English, but. All right, did that clarify questions about the schwa? and then the a uh sound or er uh sound when it's stressed. Okay, Kima, other questions? There was a discussion about it on Facebook, so if you wanna go back and look at it, there's a little bit more on that. Watch your spelling. Continue went. A-N-T, not E-N-T. Now that's not such a big deal. This is the kind of mistake native speakers make all the time. Independent. <coughs> You'll see many native speakers writing a n d all the uh, uh, dent e a a n t independent yeah a n t all the time, and I have I'm sure at some time or other. 
it's a common mistake, but doesn't mean that you should follow us doing the wrong thing. <laughs> All right, so continuant in this case is A and T. Don't write continent. It's not a continent. And utterance, someone had a very funny spelling. Utterance is probably a word some of you didn't understand, so you just wrote what you heard. To utter just means shuo chu or chu sheng. He didn't utter a word. And the noun form is utterance. And we use utterance because we don't want to say sentence, we don't want to say compound, we don't want to say word. We need something just to express the idea of yi duan hua, and that's my Chinese translation of utterance, yi duan hua. It could be just one sound, like ah, that's an utterance. Or it could be a whole sentence, that's an utterance. Yi duan hua, that's all it is. And please spell it correctly. And okay, there were some minor points I'm not going to take time now to go over, but those were the big ones. So Mindy and Sophie, anything you'd like to add you think is really important? I've seen the other notes and maybe I'll post on Facebook about them or mention them some other time. I don't want to take a whole class hour. We have very little time left. But please watch out for these things. If there's something you don't know, look it up. If you don't find a clear answer, if you're still not sure, ask. Ask the TAs, ask Mandy or Sophie, or ask myself. Post on Facebook. That's the easy way to do it. But if you need to do something in person, like you need to say two different pronunciations for me, just ask during break, after class, or in class. Okay. Is that all clear? So please clear up any issues that you have. Don't let them fester you know, until the test comes and you're still not clear, and then we have problems. We are going to, let's see what else. I'm going to assign another tutorial. <clears throat> I'm not going to turn on the projector. I don't think we need it. But it's already on the website, on the syllabus. I want you to do the tutorial on plosives part one. The link is there. Just go to the link. You've already done the tutorial on voicing. Is that right? Do you have any questions? I find these tutorials truly outstanding. You can learn a lot about teaching from those tutorials because doing them step by step, did you have that feeling? Because they make sure you understand this, they go on to the next step, they broke it down into very easily digestible bits. So Mark Huckville has done a tremendously good job on these, and John Maidment. There are two people who do tutorials like this. So if you have any questions, please ask. Otherwise, I'll just assume everything's OK. Go on to the next one, which is Tutorial on Plosives Part 1. OK? And that's it. All that's left for today is to continue in Chapter 2. All right? Our next reader, get ready, please. And we're starting from the second paragraph of chapter two. Let's go. Um, Vivian, in this, in this chapter... And read um, just a bit louder. Go ahead. In these chapters, uh, we will be concerned okay, with... Okay, that's good. I'm sorry I have to stop you right away. But I keep reminding you that this is very often a function word, so we shouldn't stress it, right? But sometimes it is emphatic. This one, not that one. It's contrastive. So, in this chapter, if I read it that way, what is implied? As opposed to chapter one. Because we finished chapter one, that's the only one we finished. So, in this chapter, so we will stress it in this chapter. And the same thing is with some and others. Like, I have some books, 一些书, but some books do it this way and some books do it that way or other books do it that way. 当有对比的时候,那就是要放中音,没有对比的话就不放中音. This is the same. I'm sorry, go ahead. In this, chap in this chapter, in this chapter, in this chapter, we will be concerned with, we, we will be concerned, we will be concerned, with con not concerned everybody, concerned, Consider. consider, not consider, consider, consider. concede, concede. Confer. confer, and this one is concerned. concerned. Yeah, don't say con or con or whatever you're saying, it's con. Consider, confer, concerned, dun dun, okay? Uh, we will be concerned, concerned with the 
phonetic transcription of careful speech, the style of speech you use to show someone how to pronounce a word. This is called the citation style of speech. Whenever you see something in bold, what does it tell you? It's important. It will probably be on a... Probably will, because when teachers are preparing tests, their eyes kind of scan through the chapter, and the bold terms, the terms in bold, jump out at you. And you say, oh, that's a good test question. And then you write a question about that. So bold... Uh, items in bold are especially important. Very often they will be on a test. This idea is extremely important. Citation style of speech. And that's one difference between experienced and less experienced language teachers. In a place like Taiwan, and it's not just East Asia, it's, it applies elsewhere where they don't have a large supply of native speakers of English or other languages that they want taught. If you grab somebody off the street and you ask them questions, They'll say, well, how do you pronounce this word? For example, zimu a the whole book. They will say, that's a book. And then maybe a lot of people will start saying, I have a book. And how does that sound to you now, given your training? It sounds weird, right? So you're not native speakers, but you already have a good feel that we don't use citation forms for a lot of what kinds of words? What kind of a word is is a. It's an article, and an article is an example of a function word, right? So function words usually are read with a reduced vowel, with a schwa, which we were just talking about. They are not read in their citation forms. So citation form, that's a compound by the way, is a very, very useful concept when you are trying to explain things, one of the things that language does. And namely, that is, when you read something in isolation, for example, 过程的程, how do you pronounce it? 程. But when you say taxi, how do you say it? Do you say 计程车 or do you say 计程车? 计程车, right? So, the citation form of that particular word is 程, right? 它的程度很好, if you want to say it very carefully, that's what he's talking about when he says in careful speech. Because a lot of you have better training in English than you have in Chinese. That is the harsh reality. Is that not true? And that's not a good thing. It's good that you have good training in English. But you need to catch up in your native language. A lot of the things you learn in English, you need to carry over into Chinese because so many of the things apply to Chinese. Not everything, but a lot of things do. And one is citation form. Citation form. So when you're teaching a foreigner Chinese, which some of you might do in a language exchange, be aware that you're going to pronounce it very clearly according to the dictionary when you read the word in what? Isolation. As soon as it occurs in a compound or in a phrase or sentence, you will probably pronounce it in some different way. Just like cheng becomes ng, jianche, So if a student, if somebody asks you, how do you pronounce cheng, is anybody going to say ng? Nobody will say that, right? But that's how you normally say it in the word taxi. All right, and if you are interested in these uh, abbreviations in Mandarin, I have a paper that I wrote on it. I will put the link on the site when somebody reminds me, if I don't remember myself. So I wrote a whole paper on this because I noticed it in my own kids. And everybody does it. So citation form is very, very different from, from what? A phonetic description in, of connected speech. Continue. Transcriptions of citation style are particularly useful in language documentation and lex uh, lexicography. What is lexicography? And studying words, dictionaries and words, okay? And also serve as the basic phonetic observations described in phonology. In chapter five, we will discuss we will discuss That was pretty good, but can you make it longer? Chapter five. In chapter five. Five. We, five. Yeah. We will discuss phonetic.
Not we will. It's we will discuss. We will discuss phonetic transcription of connected speech, the style that used in normal conversation. The style that used in normal conversation. Does this look like there's a mistake? Do you see a mistake in the text? That is used. Okay, we're going to have to email Professor Johnson. <laughs> the style that is used in normal conversation. And that's where we need to stop. So please start next time. Okay, Kaima? That's it for today. We'll see you on Wednesday.